Talkers. Welcome back to the podcast. It drops every Tuesday, same time, 7 a.m. And it is always so rewarding to hear uh, your thoughts on each podcast. So please keep them coming and also keep sharing with your friends and family. We love it because we want this Real Talk family to continue to grow. And we just keep getting these awesome guests. And I love that I get to talk to this woman in studio. I met her only a couple of weeks ago for the first time in real life, real human form. And uh, it was um, it was such a privilege. Monique Murphy, welcome to Real Talk. How are you? I'm doing quite well. Thank you for having me. For our listeners and for our viewers, if you're unaware who Monique Murphy are, you've been living under a rock, but she's a silver medalist from the Paralympics at Rio for the S10 400 metre freestyle. And I did just want to ask, what is today? Today? Uh, today is the day that I woke up from a week-long coma eight years ago. Isn't that ironic that I messaged <laughs> you and said, hey, are you free to have a chat on my podcast? And you were like, yeah. I was like, yeah, I'll just wake up for it. <laughs> <laughs> Snap. I, our listeners are probably going, okay, what? what? <laughs> uh, we will rewind shortly. <laughs> but before we get into it, we like to start with a fast five. And I've got my fast five here, thanks to uh, my PA and graphic guru, Harrison Toby. So your least favourite or favourite doctor? Favourite doctor would be Dr. Graham Chonk. Love it. Shout out. <laughs> what about celebrity crush? Oh, first celebrity crush, Ewan McGregor in Moulin Rouge. Oh, I don't know. I'll have to can Google. sing, can dance. Ticks. Ticking all the boxes. Oh, 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 10 out of 10. <laughs> what about your ritual for pre-swim? As little ritual as possible. Ah. Then you don't have to worry about things going wrong. Love. <laughs> Pump up song? Oh, I have a whole playlist. Um, but uh, Explosive by Bond, it was the theme music for the Sydney 2000 games. So that one always gives, gives me chills because I remember watching those games as a kid and, yeah, I've got to stand on that stage myself now so oh gosh that gives me butterflies <laughs> cheat meal oh chocolate any chocolate dark chocolate dark chocolate <laughs> out of any i love dark chocolate oh, okay i won't judge you for it i'm such like a, a milk chocolate kind of gal but nah, it's got to be dark this is your past five and i can't disagree <laughs> sorry about my reaction uh, also we like to ask one word that best describes you Monique. so what do you think uh, I would choose the word adaptive, but if you were to ask anybody else, they would probably say loud. I like both. <laughs> why are you? Why do you say adaptive? Uh, so since my accident, I think that's the thing that I'm most proud of about myself is how I have adapted to all the changes. And even before the accident and since, change is the only constant. It's always, everything is always going to continue to change. And I think I'm very proud of how I manage those changes now and how I can prepare myself for them, both mentally and physically, to then make the most of them. Not look at them as a barrier or a setback, but as an opportunity. Oh, my gosh. Just when I thought I couldn't admire you anymore. <laughs> okay. Well, we're going to hear your story very shortly. But just beforehand, I would like to let everybody know about our partners in workplace law, Shane and Athena, um, uh, basically run a, a program where you can be involved as a female or any athlete and they are here to give your assistance uh, in sport, representation, tribunals, um, if it is contractual issues that you need to get through or whether it's personal branding, they are genuine about helping you and that's why they're genuine about helping me at Real Talk. Raw and relevant, we love it. Um, but they're also just passionate about helping players off field, on field, whatever it may be, um, they just really want to help with your careers away from sport. And it's incredibly important, which Mon, I'm sure you'll be able to weigh into as well, because outside of sport, you need to have an income. Shane and Athena, workplacelaw.com.au is where you can get some help, no matter your gender, no matter what you do, you don't need to be a millionaire. Uh, but let's get into your story. Monique Murphy, take us back to 2014, where I guess life changed for you. It did indeed. So eight years ago today, I woke up from a week-long coma and the first two people I saw were my mum and my dad, obviously fretting quite a bit. And all I remember is waking up and knowing I'd been asleep for too long. So I have no memory of my accident. I have no memory of being in a coma. I couldn't hear people. I couldn't dream or anything like that. So I just remember waking up and seeing my mum and my dad. Uh, they're divorced. 
and they do not live in Melbourne, which is where I was. So my initial thought was, <laughs> oh, shit, I've done something really bad. <laughs> I'm in trouble. Um, and they just kept saying, we're here, sweetie. We love you. We love you. And I'm like, of oh, course gosh. you do. You're my parents. <laughs> so I had no idea what was going on. I couldn't understand what had happened to get me to that hospital room. I didn't realize I was in hospital. What I did know is that I was in a lot of pain, but what that told me was that my body was okay. So it was sort of like a survival checklist, I guess. And straight away, I knew that my spine was okay because I could feel my body. I could feel the pain. Mm -hmm. And I knew that my head was okay, or as my dad would say, no brain, no more brain damage than before. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely father. Um, we love you. <laughs> because I could hear and understand what my parents were saying. So we ended up, I had lots of tubes through my mouth. I'd been on life support for a week. Mm -hmm. And after a very long game of charades, <laughs> we, I managed to convey to my parents, I don't remember. And my dad replied and told me that I had jumped from a fifth floor balcony. Oh my gosh. And those words, it was like my head was just a void and I couldn't latch on to those words because they did not make sense to me at all. And that is what my parents had been told. And the police had also ruled it as a suicide attempt without checking with me, without <laughs> checking with my family. So my parents had spent a whole week, firstly, not knowing whether I was going to wake up, but also being unsure as to what my mental state was wow. or would be when I woke up. So they were some pretty tough words to hear. Um, and I had to go through so many psych tests with like trauma psychologists and this and that. And they all ruled that I was all right. And I felt fine. Things had been, I was 19 at uni, um, Things with the guy I'd been seeing weren't going too well, but that was probably the extent of the drama in I mean, my like life. Every every <laughs> yeah, teenage classic. girl and boy. Yeah, yep. exactly. Um, I'd started a new job. I'd started my new degree. So it was general life challenges. Um, but as far as I'm aware, uh, coma does not cure depression. Mm. And I was ruled um, mentally sound, I suppose. And but I had to wear this um, at-risk bracelet on my arm the entire time that I was in hospital. So I struggled with that a lot. I felt like I really had to prove to everybody that I was okay. No one saw the accident and I don't remember it. So what I've been told since, which I have to sort of accept as my story, is that I fell from a fifth floor balcony and I landed on the glass roof below. And this was at a uni event. It was the balcony of my room, so where I lived at the University Village. And it's about a 15, 20 metre fall. So I landed on the glass roof below, which was angled. And because of that, it meant that it broke my fall in stages. So while at one moment the whole world was sort of going against me and I fell, there was another moment where everything went perfectly and the way that I landed meant that I'm still here right now. My brain is perfectly intact, thanks, Dad, and <laughs> so is my spine. So that was really what happened and not knowing is a huge challenge. Mm. It was very difficult to not be able to blame anyone. Yeah. You know, to have a bit of anger and confusion, but not be able to put it anywhere because I didn't know what had, what had happened. But what I did come to realise was if we'd gone down legal avenues um, or if we'd gone down any kind of avenue to find out what happened, it would take so much effort from myself and it wouldn't result in anything. Mm -hmm. Nothing was going to give me my leg back. So focusing on things that I couldn't control didn't seem appealing to me. So it was, in, it was in hospital that we made that decision that we're just going to focus on what comes next rather than try to find answers. And it has been agreed by my doctors that they suspect my drink was spiked that night. Wow. Hard, 
to swallow. I was about to say hard pill to swallow. <laughs> Very out of context. Um, but in all seriousness, yeah, you you were in a coma. You lose some of your leg mm-hmm. um, and your life changes forever. You could have gone down two different paths. You could have lived up to the tag of wearing at risk and, yep. and have depression and, and be mm. this depressed human being who would never accept that you now had a disability or you could be you (laughs) you could be a Paralympian you could stand on the die at the Rio Olympic Games Mm. and be incredibly proud of what you've achieved surely there were some dark times I have no doubt absolutely and it was a credit to my parents who would sit down and have those difficult conversations with me and I was very keen to get back to my life I just wanted to get back to it where it was the day before the accident. I wasn't swimming anymore at that point. I just wanted to get going with uni. I wanted to go out with friends. I wanted to travel and not be held back by this very inconvenient <laughs> accident <laughs> that had happened. And that's all all I wanted to do. And I think there was the biggest challenge for me was as nothing wrong with having a mental illness or having depression or anything like that. It was just that I didn't fit into that box. I wasn't having dark thoughts. I wasn't Mm. feeling depressed. I was angry and confused, but overall I was grateful because a fifth floor balcony. You shouldn't be here. I shouldn't be here. And again, it's a, it's a credit to my parents. The moment I woke up and learned that I'd survived I was just grateful. And in saying that, I wasn't aware they'd amputated my foot. <laughs> There's a, our brains are really horrible things sometimes. <laughs> and even now I can still wiggle my toes and feel my foot. So when I woke up from the coma, I could feel my foot and I did not realize they had amputated it. So that was, <laughs> that was a little bit, um, a little bit strange. And I remember looking at my body Uh, shortly after waking up and thinking, why is my foot bandaged in a point? So rather than at a 90 degree angle, why is it at a point? And I remember thinking that and, but because I could still feel it, I'd have no reason to think they (laughs) removed it. Wow. So much information (laughs) to, to take in. Yeah. So many. And I think that was the beginning of really starting to understand you can hold more than one emotion at a time. And you can be angry, but grateful. And you can be frustrated, but still thankful that you're alive. Like you can have so many emotions at any one time. And that really carried through with me to the Paralympics 900 days later, um, about two and a half years, because I was so excited to be achieving my childhood dream, Mm -hmm. which had always been to go to an Olympic Games but now I was at a Paralympics, so I was proud, but it was also a time where I couldn't, I couldn't be proud without acknowledging how I'd gotten there. And that was still a very fresh, traumatic emotion that went alongside it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm speechless. And then all I, all I look at now is this, you know, like this is a silver medal. <laughs> Can you please hold it up for us and, and take us to that race and, and, after the race and the elation <laughs> and the emotion, run me through it. Uh, it's Swim me through it. Swim me through it. <laughs> <laughs> well, swimming became um, part of my therapy after the accident, so hydrotherapy. And I, from the moment they put me in that pool, there was something in me that knew I was not going to be getting out anytime soon. <laughs> and, you know, so many people message me, after the accident going, oh, you'll be a Paralympian. And I'm pretty sure when my brother said those words to me, I told him very politely to F off (laughs) (laughs) because I had no interest in taking my broken body and going back into that kind of training. And I suddenly had this clarity that just because I now have a disability does not mean a medal is going to be handed to me. It's not going to be any easier. And I think I didn't really acknowledge or know anything about the Paralympics before my accident but if I'm being honest I think there was something in me that when I saw athletes with a disability and them competing I just thought there was something different and I sort of associated that with there's something easier about it because I think sometimes we we still do look at people with a disability and we can give handouts 
and things and use them as tokens for diversity and we forget to acknowledge them as people first mm -hmm. and foremost. And it was in that moment in hospital where I thought, this is not going to be any easier. If anything, it's going to be 10 times harder and I am not interested whatsoever. And it was just through hydrotherapy that I couldn't deny how much I love being in the water. And I was studying social work at the time. And my parents said to me, if you're going to continue to work in social work, which can be quite a all-consuming line of work, they said, you need to make sure there is something just for you something that you can go to and have your release and that you can just spend some time on for yourself. And really what they're talking about is self-care. Mm. And we quite often get that mixed up with feeling selfish when we take time to do that. But it was that was swimming for me. And in the early days, I didn't want to do the physiotherapy. I didn't want to go for walks. My prosthetic was clunky. I'd had a total of nine operations. So um Pretty much both arms, both legs had received surgery. So any kind of movement was exhausting. But in the water, I just felt this freedom and, you know, this m mobility that I just didn't have on land. So it was just as simple as I got curious as to what I could accomplish. Mm -hmm. It was like everything had been reset. All my PBs and everything as an able bod didn't matter. It was like, this is a complete fresh start. Let's see what we can do. And... That attitude is what got me a year later, one year exactly after the accident, I was announced on the World Championship swim team. And the year after on my 21st birthday, because um, my birthday is about two weeks after the accident. Mm -hmm. And it's always when we have our swimming trials. Gosh, <laughs> so on my 21st birthday, <laughs> um, I qualified, that was my 22nd, sorry, 22nd birthday, I qualified for the Paralympics. And a few months later, I was behind the blocks, absolutely oh, crying, but trying not to. <laughs> I was in the marshalling room and I'm thinking, oh, I'm pretty calm. I'm pretty, pretty chill. And it was day eight of the competition. So I'd had a few events. They'd all gone well. This was my chance for a medal. And I looked at my... Um, my smartwatch and my heart rate was about 120 <laughs> <laughs> and I started, I was like, Oh, I am not as calm as I think. And I told my parents when I walked out, um, you know, that moment where your name's announced and you're know, representing Australia. And I said to my family, I will not try to find you in the crowd because I'll just cry. Mm -hmm. And I walked out and I was still <laughs> blinking back tears and just saying in five minutes, in five minutes, you can let it all out. Yeah. And it's one of those things when I train, that's when I do all my thinking. That's when I critique every little second of what I'm doing so that come race day, the moment that that buzzer goes to start the race, everything's automatic. Mm -hmm. And you can sort of, in the same way as what they did when they put me in a coma, they turned my brain off so my body could just fight for my life. And it's the same when I come to race. You've got, I've just got to turn my body off, uh, my brain off sometimes and let my body do what I've trained it to do and I was quite quite sick I'd caught a cold but I knew that you know not feeling well on one day wouldn't erase what had now become about 14 years of swimming mm. and training and I was out on one of the edge lanes so I could see that the leader was way out in front but I couldn't see anyone else and so I just focused on my own race do my own thing and in the end I touched second and 0.49 of a second behind was fourth place. Wow. And that girl got fourth by 0.03 of oh. a second. <laughs> so within half a second, you had first, uh, you had second, third, and fourth. So, yeah, it was that reiteration, just something we hear coaches say all the time and something I know, but you race your own race. <laughs> oh. And I, I really strongly believe if you do your absolute best on the day, then you can feel nothing but excited and you know I didn't win it was, <laughs> it was really only two years after my accident but you know it's that idea of going for gold that you always you've got to dream big mm -hmm. um but when I hit that wall I had nothing left in my body it was I gave everything I possibly could and that's why I will never look at this medal and feel anything but pride you shouldn't feel anything but pride <laughs> far out like it's so incredible I can't imagine hitting that wall and being like 
oh gosh, well that pays off because my heart rate was very high <laughs> beforehand. <laughs> well, when I, when I turned around and I saw the number two, I was just gobsmacked because oh. it, was, it was literally like, oh, this is what you dream of and it's become a reality. And there was also an element of, yeah, I, I am capable you know, you always question yourself, you doubt yourself. It becomes, it can become quite a common practice, unfortunately. And I think especially for women, mm. we doubt ourselves a lot. And it was just that moment of like, actually, no, we, we can, we can do it. Yeah. And then I saw my time and I hadn't done a PB and I was so devastated oh, <laughs> because no. my mental space going into this event, I was going in with the fastest time that season. Mm -hmm. So there were two other girls who PB were faster than me, but I was going in the fastest that season. So, you know, the media love to always talk about going for gold, but I was very careful not to, not to do that because I didn't want anything, you know, if I did a PB and got fourth, I would still be incredibly proud. Yeah. So I was just focused on doing a PB because if <laughs> I did that, you knew you should be all right. I would be, I would be happy with yeah. myself. And I ended up, it ended up being the other way around. I got the medal and not the PB, but it took me a little while and to process the race. And the only person who did a PB was the winner. Yeah. So by day eight of competition, we'd been away for almost a month. Sometimes it's not about getting the PB. <laughs> it's, it, that was my best on that day. And our best on any given day isn't always going to be the same. So it's about... The circumstances that are around you, making the most of them, doing your best. And that's exactly what I did on that day. So, oh, You're a Paralympian <laughs> and you're a Paralympic silver medalist and no one can ever take that away from exactly. you. Exactly. Which is incredible. You come back from Rio and then the next cycle starts. But this is actually one of the questions why I really wanted to get you in here was to talk about endometriosis because that's something that has been masked but it's incredibly common in mm. females. And I'd love to hear what happened in that time period and how you've managed it in your elite career. So for anyone who doesn't know, endometriosis is where tissue similar to that of the lining of the uterus grows outside of the uterus. And it's this horrible thing that just grows in line with your period. So you, it, there tends to be a bit of a cycle in terms of the pain that you can experience. And when you bleed, that growth also bleeds. So if anyone's ever had a corked muscle, which I have myself before, it's like that because you are bleeding into muscles. You are bleeding in and around your organs. It is as painful as it is sounding. And the cousin of endometriosis is called adenomyosis. And that's where the lining in your uterus grows into the uterus muscle. Great. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I am very lucky to be able to say I'm not lucky at all. I have both of these conditions. And the worst part about having these conditions in a elite sport environment is that there is so little knowledge and recognition about them. It took me 14 doctors, most of them on sports teams, before I could get a diagnosis. So when you said before, who's my fav favorite doctor, Dr. Graham Tronk is the 14th doctor I saw. And he was the first one to listen to me and actually validate what I was going through. Oh my gosh. And he booked me in for surgery two weeks later where they had found endometriosis and there was an extensive removal. Graham's not one who uses um, the stages. There's... Some doctors refer to endo in four stages, but because the pain that you might experience at stage four isn't necessarily the pain someone else experiences. Mm -hmm. So we don't use those ones. I just know that there was an extensive amount of endometriosis in there. I then got back to training and went to the world championships two months later, and I missed the podium by less than half a second. Wow which came with a huge funding cut and considering that endosurgery, which is considered elective, um, wow. my bank account did not need that at wow. that time. So then what happens after that and how do we make it recognised as an actual non-elective? Nobody chooses that <laughs> endo, let me tell you that right now. What do you do? What can we do? 
Well, it's it's about getting the right education from the right sources. So I'm an ambassador for the charity Quendo, mm-hmm. Q-E-N-D-O. And it was, I went into my GP and I said, I want to go see an endo specialist. And he's like, why? I was like, these symptoms have to amount to something. And I'm seeing a lot of talk on social media about endo. So let's go see. Yeah. <laughs> and it's it's about talking about it a bit more. It's about being honest with our experiences and it's really a cultural shift that we need because we've all grown up thinking, oh, period cramps, that's just what happens. But period pain is not normal. Mm. And I think the biggest challenge I had was that coaches didn't recognize it or accept it. Things like, are you sure you're in pain today? You might just be a bit sore or it's all in your head. Or, you know, I suggested that we do training with the coaches because I can understand that it's not, no one's choosing to be ignorant. It's just that we're not taught about, I went to an all girls school. I wasn't taught about this. How do we expect that the 99% of coaches that are men are going to know about this either? And that suggestion was met with, we don't want it to become the next excuse. Wow. And that's, that's what needs to change. You know, before COVID, if you rocked up to training with a cold, your coach would tell you to go to the doctor. And all I want to see is that if, you know, women are walking into training with period pain, that they are getting that same advice to go see a doctor for that pain because mm. pain is not normal. Because I'd spent part of the delay with my um, diagnosis was because I started to question whether I was actually any good at sport anymore. I was so – fatigue was a huge symptom for me. And doctors would be like, you're an athlete. Of course you're fatigued. And I'd start to think, well, maybe I'm not good enough. Maybe I can't get through a training session anymore. Maybe – I need to go do something else because I can't, my body's not keeping up. And that wasn't at all the case, but that it took a huge hit to my self-worth. And that's what was really, really challenging. Like looking back, that's something I'm still trying to repair yeah. because it just came from so many angles. And at the end of the day, if you don't, you don't get those medals, yeah. <laughs> you don't get the funding, you don't get that validation. And when I look in, at my lead up to Rio, there was a lot going on, but it all seemed worth it because I got a medal. Mm. And then when I got to the championships in 2019 and I didn't get a medal, it's a very hard to justify yeah. <laughs> everything you've gone through when it doesn't, doesn't work out. But because of that, I was then able to really start to look at where we need to make changes and also start talking to my friends a lot more honest, more honestly and Turns out um, quite, a, quite a few of them have ended up going to see my doctor and have also got diagnoses. Yeah. So there's a lot more of us. It's one in nine. One in nine. In Australia, but it would definitely be higher because that's just the people who can afford to go get the surgery. Yeah. You think about COVID, it's elective or would have been cancelled. Yeah. So, and also even if it's pain that you can get through, mm. you tend to just go, oh, I'll have some uh, Panadol, and apragesic, whatever, yep. and, and you just let it slide. You don't mm. actually look into it and most people don't discover the complications their body might have until they're trying to get pregnant so and and that's the thing by then you've finished sport if you are a sports person and you know you can't really use that it's harder than to use that experience to shape and change things and I think it's where my frustration comes is that the younger athletes are still being treated the way I was and I don't want to see the cycle repeated. So yeah. that's where um, being an ambassador for Endo, uh, Quendo comes in yeah. because I just want to see, I want to see that culture shift and I want to see women being validated for the pain that mm. they're going through so we don't have to keep going through it. <laughs> it's education and information, which is huge and yeah. you're doing exactly that. Before we do wrap things up, I need to ask, what does the future hold for you? You're not done yet. <laughs> Not by a long shot. Um, well, I have just had my 21st surgery. <laughs> I feel like I did, never got a cake for my 21st birthday because I was racing at my first national. So I feel like maybe this time I get a cake. Um, so I'm recovering from that and all things going well, I would like to return to the water. Mm-hmm. Um, but I am definitely at a point now where pushing through the pain is not an option that has seen me get up to 21 surgeries so you know it's all about we push ourselves in training or just in life to be the best version we can but there is a difference between pushing through pain and 
growth and pushing yourself to be to become stronger or to become better there's a very there is a difference there so the pain I'm not I'm not interested in no, not the pain part no pain <laughs> but I mean touch wood hopefully can get back in the water um and yeah we can give it a Give it another crack. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. Ooh, like it. Paris looms <laughs> not too far away. I appreciate you coming on so much, and I feel like that's part one. I, I, I think we could have a whole <laughs> chapter book here on Real Talk. Uh, before we do let you go, though, just a shout out Workplace Law, our proud partners here on the Real Talk podcast. And if you do need any assistance in terms of contractual agreements or representation at a tribunal, um, or whether it's just personal branding, they're here to help, and they really want to help female athletes outside of their sporting field. Field. So uh, Shane and Athena, the team at workplacelaw.com.au, get around them because they're very genuine, they're real, they're raw and they're relevant. Ticks all those boxes. <laughs> Just like you, my friend Monique Murphy, I appreciate you coming on and I can't wait for chapter two. <laughs> chapter 50 by now, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Until next Tuesday, have a good one. <laughs>